It is now 10 o'clock and we would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Caesar, and I will be your host for today. Today is February 9th, 2021, and you are here for the 2019 CBSC Intervening Code Cycle Updates. This is a second part in a two-part series and we'll be covering the California Electrical Code, the California Mechanical Code, the California Plumbing Code, California Existing Building Code, where we're going to clarify a bit the OSHPOD 1R provisions, and we're going to be going over some structural clarifications as they relate to Chapter 3A in the building code. You are here for roughly about an hour presentation with some question and answer at the end of the presentation. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to download the handouts for this presentation, which are in the handout section of the GoTo panel. Again, that's uh, in the handout section of the GoTo panel. Or if you have problems doing that, if you have issues doing that, please feel free to email us at regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. Again, that's R-E-G-S-U-N-I-T at oshpod.ca.gov. If you are having uh, wanting questions about a specific project that are not related to this presentation, please feel free to email us at that same email address, which is regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. During this presentation, please keep your, your questions generic and type them into that question uh, question bar at the go to uh, toolbox. And we'll go ahead and answer those questions at the end of the presentation. If you are experiencing transmission difficulties, please feel free to log off and log back in using the same login information that the GoTo software handed you and shared with you uh, prior to logging in. For today, as presenters, we have Mr. Richard Tannehill. He's a senior architect and the Building Standards Unit Supervisor. We have Mr. Roy Lobo. He's a principal structural engineer with the, with the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. We have Mr. Bill Gow, senior electrical engineer with, with the office as well. And we have Dave Mason. He's a senior mechanical engineer with the office as well. So Richard, if you're there, I hand the presentation over to you. All right, thank you, Caesar. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction here. As uh, Caesar mentioned, this is the second of a two part series for the 2019 California Building Code intervening uh, edition that comes into effect in July of this year. Um, it was printed in January uh, last month, so you have six months to review it, and um, it takes effect July 1st. Next slide. Um, so for the, the the first part of this session was con, con, included the administrative code as well as the um, California building code and the structural portions of that in uh, volume one, uh, volume two, part two. I'm still looking at this, the title slide. Yeah, Caesar, can you uh, advance the slides? Apparently, I'm sure, not able no, to. No, no problem. Hold on. Richard, let me know. You should be looking at the next slide. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to cover part three is a, the electrical code, part four mechanical code, part five plumbing code, and we'll get into the uh, part 10, the existing building code for both uh, architectural as well as structural. Um, one of the things we're going to, you'll see a lot of is the, the banner has removed the 1R symbol from the OSHPOD 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in a lot of cases, not every case. And we just want to make it clear that the 1R is the building type or the type of building and not necessarily the for the occupants going into that building. So once a building is removed from acute care service, it becomes a 1R building. And then you would apply any code for the occupants going into that, build, into that building. So if it's a business or a clinic space, it's going to be an OSHPOD 3. If it's a uh, skilled nursing facility, it's going to be an OSHPOD 2. So the OSHPOD 1R um, would apply to anything serving that building as a, coming from the hospital, as well as the building itself, but not the occupancies. OK. 
Okay, with that, we can go on the next slide, and I believe this will be electrical. Oh, not electrical. Uh, real quick, what we did, we kind of color coded the slides, so it makes it a little bit easier to uh, understand what was there before as well as what's new. So anything in uh, bold black text or regular text is existing text with no change. The underlined blue text is anything that was added new. Uh, if it has a red highlight, it's just really there for emphasis. You probably won't see a whole lot of that today. Um, if it's a gray strikeout, that means that's the old text that was deleted. Uh, anything in purple text is just for reference only. And again, you shouldn't see too much of that in this session. And with this, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm here to present the mid-cycle changes for the California Electrical Code. And these changes are primarily housekeeping and clarification. There's uh, not a lot of material, so uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Next slide, please. Okay, so in Article 89, we have updated the definition for OSHPUD 1R to include SBC or freestanding buildings. It includes either building. Uh, this change is also made in the building code. And so again, this is just a housekeeping change. Next slide, please. In Article 110, we had an OSHPOD am amendment for approval. And OSHPOD requires all equipment to be listed, labeled, and certified by a national recognized testing laboratory. Uh, we deleted this because in Article 110.3C, the model code requires all equipment to be listed as well. So for redundancy, we removed this. Uh, it could pose a problem. so. After further discussion, we will be adding this back into the 2022 electrical code. But to be clear, OSHPOD requires all equipment to be listed by a recognized testing laboratory as recognized by OSHA. The other change is a old requirement that's been in the code for a long time. For cleanup purposes, we are removing it. Uh, you still need to meet the anchorage and bracing requirements in the California building code. Next slide. Here we just again, um, the first change in 517.1a is a pointer to the requirements for uh, OSHPUD 1R that are found in the existing building code, section 309. The second addition to the code is for electrical equipment schedules to clearly indicate what equipment is powered by the central electrical system and the appropriate special seismic certification for that equipment. And lastly, in 517.4, this is a building code reference to services and systems and utilities, we had added missing code references in uh, 1225 and 1228. So again, just more cleanup. Next slide. Again, this here is the OSHPOT amendment for the essential electrical systems for hospitals. Our requirement originally said that you needed to meet 517.29 through 30. This was caused by a model code change that was also incorrect. The correct reference is 517.29 through 517.35 are the requirements for the essential electrical system for hospitals. So again, more housekeeping. Next slide, please. Again, more cleanup work. In 517.123, you'll find the nurse call system requirements. 
we had a requirement for a psychiatric nursing unit in, in 517.123A5. We're removing that requirement because it's redundant. 517.123 already has requirements for psychiatric nursing units in, in uh, 123F. So again, just clean up work. Next slide, please. In uh, the model code in Article 517.30, fuel cells were added as a acceptable alternative power source for the essential electrical system. We failed to add at the time a requirement for the amount of on-site fuel that is required when fuel cells are used. So we added this exception that points to the fuel requirements that you'll find for generators in Article 700.12b2. So if you're using a fuel cell as an alternate power source, it needs on-site fuel just like a generator. I will note that CMS still uses um, NFPA 99-2012 and references NFPA 110-2010 both of which require generators for the alternate power source. So we won't be seeing much fuel cells being used as the primary source of the essential electrical system, but the code is being updated, so in the future it definitely can be used. Next slide. And we removed Oshpod from the Oshpod banner 1R in the following sections. And this again was just cleanup. When the 2019 code came out, 1R was added to all the Oshpod uh, banners. That wasn't correct. And so again, we're just doing cleanup. And that should be all my changes for the California Electrical Code. Thanks, Bill. Before we get into uh, mechanical, I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, go ahead and post them in the uh, in the chat for the question box on your on your dashboard. Dave. OK. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this is Dave Mason, senior mechanical engineer at Oshpod in the uh, building standards unit. I work with Bill and Richard and uh, today I will be uh, taking you through the mechanical and plumbing changes in the intervening code cycle. And uh, there might be a little bit of housekeeping in uh, some of my changes, but um, we don't even cover all of that here. There were just really minor stuff as far as housekeeping. There's some other more technical changes and we'll go through those. So, uh, okay, application here. Am I, uh, am I driving this now, Caesar? Uh, I will go ahead and, and advance the slides for you, Dave. All right, you thank mind. you. Okay. Um, Oshpod 1 and 1R, that's a recurring theme here. And um, with general acute care hospitals, non-conforming hospital or SBC or freestanding that have been removed from acute care service. Uh, I know Richard's already talked about this quite a bit. So uh, I'm gonna skip and go to the next slide, Caesar. Okay, once again, uh, authority having jurisdiction, AHJ. Uh, you see the 1R is added there, and then we just did some housekeeping on uh, 4 and 5. Next slide, Caesar. Okay. Uh, general requirements. We have 3017 for general. Closet and alcove installations. The main thing we want to look at here um, is that there was there was some old kind of odd language in both uh, model code and Oshpod language uh, for closet or alcoves, uh, basically boiler installations. And at one point it looked like Atmo had actually changed the title of this paragraph and didn't change the substance of the paragraph. So overall, it was kind of a, it was tough to uh, enforce and tough to follow, tough to understand. So we went through and we kind of gutted this and we actually moved the language up to a more modern, uh, useful, uh, standard. And this is addressed later in the in the mechanical code, which we'll come to. But here you see we're lining out a bunch of this uh, language that was uh, kind of a challenge for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. 
Uh, we had a rec oh, okay. Looks like we're skipping one there. Um, Caesar, can you move it back one? Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Um, on our end here, we're dealing with some lag, so so the slides might move around a little bit on us. But here we see the um, building automation systems. This is a whole new section. Um, what we were looking for is localized control in the event of a network failure. You know, these systems with the BAS obviously work on networks. Um, in the circumstance there's a network failure, we, we basically, in uh, in working language, we, we want hand control capability on large uh, components of the system should the network go down. That's all it's really what we're looking for here. Okay, we have uh, refer, we update some uh, referrals to the building code. That's just uh, keeping us in alignment with the changes there. Uh, 320.3.1, we just do some more uh, housekeeping here. We uh, had a little, it looks like a typo or a misuse of some of the language. And at 320.4, we just clarify the title, Telephone and Technology Equipment Centers, to get that terminology right. Um, now, a more substantive change here with 320.4.4, Technology Equipment Center shall have redundant cooling systems each of sufficient capacity to provide required cooling during periods of breakdown or maintenance of either system. One system shall be non-hydronic and on essential power. So what we're looking for there is very strong redundancy. And um, this was really um, initiated because Oshpod's very interested in the maintenance and safety of data uh, in these facilities, obviously. So, so that change was put into the mechanical code. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, yeah, with Section 320.1, we, we our language was really specific that we, we need heating equipment um, on essential, but uh, we didn't specifically state fans also. Uh, in most facilities, the fans are on essential power because they are used to pressurize different spaces. So in that case, there's a requirement for fans to be on essential power. In the rare instance that the fans may not be required to be on essential power, we're saying here that they still need to be on essential power in order to deliver the hot the hot air so and that's all we're doing there's just this, a minor clarification same thing with 320.2 and um, 323 what we're looking for here is we're giving some direction to the mechanical engineers of record saying on the schedules um, please uh, include what things on the schedules need to be on essential power and uh, OSP uh, seismic certs that are required for different pieces of equipment um, even in reviewing our projects, typically we've got to go into the electrical uh, drawings to see that, that these are specified correctly for essential power. Uh, sometimes it's in the specs. Uh, it's not always clear in the drawings. This will make it clear for everybody using the drawings. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, ventilation air. Yeah, we did a little housekeeping here. You can see we lined out where it says not permitted for Oshpod on 402.0. Actually, Oshpod does apply within section 402, and that was a change that we had missed all the way back in 2016. And <laughs> I looked at it with my former supervisor, Glenn, uh, about a year ago, and we looked at each other and said, what were we thinking? We, we should have picked that up. So that was cleaned up. So as you get into section 402, occupiable spaces, um, we say, you know, it's uh, occupiable spaces listed in, in table 402.1. That's model code, and that's for non-medical spaces. So we add also spaces in table 4A. Those will be ventilated for this code section. We make that clear here. So um, we remove the uh, reference to uh, FGI uh, just to clean up the language. And 402.1.3, we uh, get pretty specific. We say ventilation rates for areas not specified in 4A shall uh, have minimum ventilation and air change per ASHRAE 62.1. Where areas with prescribed ventilation rates in both standards exist in 62.1 and table 4A, uh, the higher the two shall be used. Um, so the language in the model code, just for everybody's information, is basically adopted and copied right out of 62.1 for non-medical spaces for ventilation rates. So, so um, that's that's kind of the background on that. And hopefully this will add clarification and uh, help them in the directions they need to go. Next slide, please.
Okay. Yeah, there's some areas in model code in 62.1 style ventilation that uh, do not apply to healthcare. And uh, they're basically kind of omitted in ASHRAE 170. So we're trying to uh, show that here. Some of the sections uh, just do not apply. I think it's 4023 even says, you know, we start, uh, uh, we have occupancy sensor type of requirements and things like that. These things just don't apply. So we said some of these sections uh, within 402 just do not apply. Uh, in system details, we have 407.4.1.7. Now, what we're doing here with this language is we are uh, just mimicking the requirements of ASHRAE 170, essentially. Um, that, that's what we're trying to do here at clarification, make sure we don't violate 170. The other thing, too, to think about for any designers out there is this kind of helps um, grease the rail, so to speak, on the use of chill beam technology in the future. So any mechanicals out there, look at this new change to 407417 and uh, think about it in that light. I think you'll uh, I think you'll see the value in that. So, so where spaces in 4A permits air to be recirculated by room units, the portion of the minimum total air change per hour required for a space is greater than minimum outdoor air changes per hour. Uh, those Basically, those air changes above the outdoor requirement can be provided by this, provided they have these, uh, these three um, components shall not receive unfiltered, unconditioned outdoor air, um, only serves a single space, and um, provide filtration per section 4082, 4083 for air passing over any surfaces designed to condense water. And that's obviously an infection control issue, and it mimics the requirements of ASHRAE 170. And we'll get to that here in a second. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so what we're doing here with under filters, um, all we're really trying to do here is we are uh, trying to uh, not um, contradict the requirements in ASHRAE 170. We're trying to get ourselves really in line with that. Um, so you see actually a reduction in, uh, in a MERV rating at 408.2.2. So that's all we're doing here with these. Uh, Hey Dave, I don't know if you're still there. I can't. Uh, looks like we lost audio. Dave, you there? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you for a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought I, I was going to check. Um, so anyway, as I just said, hopefully, um, hopefully I got through the uh, the changes here are not very substantive, and um, and uh, the, the MERV ratings are not very difficult to achieve. They just are in alignment with ASHRAE 170. So okay, Caesar, if you can hear me, we'll go to the next slide now. Can you hear me see? There you go. Okay. Little lag here, but we uh, we got it. Okay. 408.2.4, we're just once again adding clarification. Uh, filtration for these units shall have a filter width minimum efficiency of a six versus one. Um, yeah, we had MERV one in there for non-central recirculating air handling systems. And um, once again, we're just getting in alignment with ASHRAE 170. And the MERV-1 was always kind of funny to me. We just call that a rock catcher. It really doesn't accomplish much. So uh, so we uh, we refined that a little bit. Then when we talk about skilled nursing facilities, that's handled the mechanical code with really a different kind of, uh, different section altogether in terms of filtration. And, but once again, we, uh, we're doing away with the rock catcher filter and going with a MERV-6, okay, for ASHRAE 170 requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, here we just have sections mainly where we're removing the 1R from the banner. Um, I don't have much more to say about that, so uh, we'll go to the next slide, Caesar. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that really is just so the designers out there know, when we're looking at a facility that's that's been converted to 1R, Mechanical engineers at Oshpot, we're really looking for what are you doing in the space and occupancy. And that's really what drives these requirements. So I just got a call last night on a facility that was being changed into all office space administrative. Well, you know, we see something like that. We don't see an issue with uh, plenary returns, things like that. But if you've got an operating room suite in there, 
and then we do see an issue with it. So that's uh, that's what we're doing uh, at Oshpot in a nutshell in terms of mechanical. So we're always willing to work with uh, work with you and be flexible on that. Um, this is really the, the most substantive change here. In Table 4A of Mechanical Code, we removed the 100% out, outdoor air column. And we did that because um, it was an old legacy um, allowance that was in our code that was allowed to last for a while. Um, and we were supposed to meet ASHRAE 170. And, uh, and in order to keep us uh, in compliance with the requirements needed for CMS, well, this, this column wasn't valid. This column wasn't valid because it allowed changes per hour for 100% outdoor air systems. And uh, in the recent past, ASHRAE made it very clear that that's not valid. So we have to comply with the ASHRAE 170 requirements, ASHRAE 170 2008, in order to uh, uh, make sure facilities are qualified for CMS funding. That's kind of important, of course, because it's a big chunk of the funding. So in order to uh, remove that pitfall, we did omit this column from Table 4A. And um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay. What we've done here is um, we, we had several changes to the footnotes in Table 4A. I've just pulled out a couple that I thought were uh, pretty important. We should, we should let you know that they've occurred. And that is in compounding, we are including the pressure differential requirements between the different rooms in compounding suites. Um, it can be kind of hard to dig that stuff out of the USP requirements. Um, USP requirements kind of read like gone with the wind, I've found, and it's difficult to be a designer and use those documents. So we continue to try to help the designers um, serve up some of the really important information uh, in an in easy to use way. That's all we're doing here, okay? Um, so next slide, please. Okay, uh, the other thing too, on you see 507.7, USP, when they address this issue of how to uh, configure the exhaust uh, outlets for compounding, uh, including hazardous, um, we saw some pretty funny examples on that. So we decided to um, make this a little clearer. And we found in California, we've got a lot of really good designers in the state and they were doing this anyway. They were, they were uh, designing exhaust discharges that were safe and effective and we just, uh, borrowed from from all those excellent designs and we've clarified this in the code okay okay we will go to um let's see duct systems yeah this is fine we just have a clarification the language is 604.2 uh, we'll go to the next slide please okay here's where we read readdress uh, the installation of boilers question that we took out uh, earlier, I think it was in chapter three, and, uh, and, and lined out that language um, for Oshpot that was confusing. And, and just so you know, the, the NFPA requirements for how to install boilers has um, advanced, gotten clearer, and um, the IATMO language has kind of lagged. So what we've done here is we've uh, inserted this new language in uh, the chapter on boilers and uh, and and this is the useful information we're looking for. You know, when we're reviewing projects, we don't see boilers going in that, that are not listed. They're all listed. And essentially, we're looking for uh, just a safe installation that's uh, not over overly burdensome, and uh, and that the uh, designer and construction uh, crews install per the listings for this type of equipment. That's all we're looking for here. So uh, hopefully, this will be helpful and uh, easier for everybody. Next slide, please. Okay, refrigeration. We've, uh, yeah, we've got a little bit outside the envelope on this one. What we're trying to do here is, um, we say for technology equipment centers not attached to a patient care area, the amounts shown in table 1102.2 .2 may be calculated at 100%. So you know, in general, um, in the chapter 11 on refrigeration, when you have an eye occupancy, it says, hey, you're, you're, uh, the amounts of refrigerant you can use in these facilities is you've got to take that um, max allowable and cut it in half. And what we're finding is there's a lot of systems being proposed, uh, like variable refrigerant systems, that are excellent for cooling uh, IT, room, IT rooms and stuff like this. 
and we found those were just not being uh, allowed in a lot of instances where they, they would be perfectly safe. That's all we're trying to do here. We're trying to uh, give the healthcare providers and designers more options on these types of systems. They'll, they'll help conserve energy, and uh, there's no reason why they can't be installed uh, in uh, these technology equipment centers not attached to patient care areas. So uh, that's all we're doing there, and. Uh, and we got no zero negative input on that in the public comment period, which was really nice. Next slide, please. Okay, next we'll go to the plumbing code. Um, we will, uh, well, as you'll see, we'll be addressing uh, the one issue that comes up every cycle, except this current cycle, and that's hand wash fixtures. That's kind of an off-pod favorite, it seems. So we'll go to this next slide here. We've got, um, yeah, once again, it's getting into some of the language on 1R, um, non-conforming hospital, SBC, or freestanding buildings. This is just clarification of the language, housekeeping, as Bill would say. We'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, there it is, uh, the infamous hand washing fixture section. This is in definitions in chapter two. And, um, yeah, this is really interesting. You know, there's certain things we want to make very, very clear with hand wash fixtures uh, as mechanical engineers working at Oshpod. These basically are, in our mind, they are not sinks or labs, but uh, these these words remain in the in the uh, definitions due to the heavy, I would call it the architectural influence that we have with our work at Oshpod with our fellow architects. So the, the, the change from uh, sink to laboratory, just so you know, um, all the architects out there, and we've got a lot of them tuned in. Uh, please look at the 11B requirements on on uh, on knee uh, foot foot room and knee room in 11B of the building code, because uh, with a sink you have um, a minimum requirement away from the wall. With a laboratory you have a maximum requirement away from the wall. So to get familiar with those, um, the infection control aspects are in the next line here. Where we say have fittings such that all controls can be operated without the use of hands. This is something we're always looking for. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have uh, wrist blades. You can, in a lot of cases, have wrist blades. But if it's a hand wash fixture, we don't want you touching it with your fingertips and your hands uh, uh, due to infection control concerns. And uh, D down here, uh, faucets shall be equipped with gooseneck spouts. A gooseneck spout should be a deck or fixture mounted so the discharge point of the spout return is at least 10 inches above the bottom of the basin. Water should not flow directly from the spout into the drain. This next spout shall have 180 degree return with constant radius and the outlet pointing vertically down. Now, all these things are founded in infection control. That last statement though, the 180 degree uh, return, I, I do know that we'll have some fixtures proposed that are maybe 170 degree. Um, and we'll look at those. We'll, we'll try to be as flexible as we can because there's a lot of fixtures like that. The 10 inch requirement, uh, 10 inches above the bottom of the basin, I did an analysis of all the equipment out there that's uh, being sold and offered, and that does not adversely affect uh, mar the market in any way. So um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Also, for what it's worth, temperature controls. We've had a lot of uh, fixtures proposed with uh, fingertip temperature controls um, at the base. And once again, like I said earlier, that involves something other than a wrist blade. So uh, the dirtiest parts of our hands are our fingertips. So we're trying to avoid that. Okay, the uh, the next section here shall be designed and installed to prevent splashing outside of the lavatory. We're just trying to stick with the same language there. Uh, shall have uh, shall be well fitted and sealed to prevent water leaks into the cabinetry or wall spaces. Uh, design of labor laboratories and cabinetry should not pretty, not permit storage beneath the fixture basin. I see that violated quite a bit actually, even in existing facilities out there. So shall be constructed of non-porous material. So, um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, floor drains, waste traps, and we add here um, sanitary drainage cleanouts uh, to, uh, shall, would we add that to the prohibition for operating in the delivery room? So we don't want cleanouts in these spaces. Um, actually, I don't think I've ever seen one, maybe just once proposed. So. 310.12, we have, uh, once again, we're just making sure we're correlating uh, correctly to the building code. And uh, plumbing equipment schedules is very similar to what we had in the mechanical code. We wanna make sure that on the schedules themselves, have a, have a check mark there saying, hey, this uh, needs to be on a central power. 
and or this requires special seismic certification. That'll be much easier for everybody involved in the construction of these facilities. And it'll make them easier to review too. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, 613.2. I was um, repeatedly surprised how hard this is to understand, I guess. It, can, it was confusing beforehand, so we made it very concise. The uh, We're looking for um, redundancy in the hot water uh, equipment arrangement. So we say here the arrangement of water heating equipment shall be based on the capacity and ca capability of the equipment to provide the required hot water during periods of breakdown or maintenance of any one water heater. So, you know, you can have three water heaters and uh, two of them at any time, any configuration be capable to carry the load. Uh, you can have, you can go from three to two, you can go from two to one during maintenance or breakdown, as long as you meet that load uh, during uh, taking one unit down. That's what we're trying to get after here. Uh, healthcare facilities, medical gas and medical vacuum systems. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, it's kind of tough to wordsmith it, but it says here, a medical gas source system serving an OSHPOD 1, 2, 3, or 5 building shall not be located in an OSHPOD 1R or OSHPOD 3 building. OSHPOD 1R buildings may be served by an individual main supply line from another from other OSHPOD buildings with a main valve as per NFP 99. Valve should be accessible and clearly labeled. What we're looking for here is that if we have a building that doesn't meet the uh, seismic requirements OSHPOD's trying to get in these facilities, um, we don't want the source to go down uh, with a building that's taken down by a seismic event and take out the medical gas serving other areas that are very important. Uh, you can imagine that can be an issue. So that's what we're trying to address here with this language. And uh, I, ongoing, I welcome any comments from the public on this too. If we can refine it further or answer questions, we'll do that. So uh, next slide, please. That's what I had for um, mechanical and plumbing. I did not get a chance to rehearse it. I finished the slides about bedtime last night. So <laughs> hopefully um, you found that useful and uh, look forward to answering questions uh, at the end of this. Thanks, Dave. Okay, this is Richard again. Um, we're gonna go hit part 10 now. That's easy, can you do me a favor and move the uh, pointer off the screen? Thank you. Um, Again, this is, you've seen this on all of them. We basically add non-conforming SBC or freestanding hospital for the application of buildings removed from acute care service. Next slide, please. Okay, for the uh, scope, um, for, for general scoping, Unless otherwise expressly stated, the following words and terms and purpose of this code have meanings shown in this chapter. So they're gonna have their own definitions in this chapter. For other definitions, we're just pointing back to chapter, or part one, chapter six and seven, and part two, chapter two, for further definitions. In this part 10, under general definitions, we're adding a definition for, for building official, as well as a code official. And basically, they can be used interchangeably. The reason for this is because they show up differently in different sections of the code. And um, so we just want to make sure that they both can be used interchangeably or read, uh, interpreted interchangeably. Next slide. We added a Previously in past code, we uh, added some, made some changes to the definition of substantial structural damage. Um, what we didn't realize, we were changing it for to model code as well. So we put this back to its original intent. And next slide, please. Um, and we added a new section that was OSHPOD specific and basically says the same thing that this used to say in this new language here and it has the same um, uh, reductions. So basically nothing has really changed from last code for, for healthcare, but we just put back model code language that was mistakenly changed. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that in the existing building code that was mistaken 
under 305.1, um, we were referencing for accessibility to use this section, and we added not adopted by OSHPOD to section 305. And at the same time, 305A, which is only applies to OSHPOD 1 facilities, um, had a whole list of accessibility features, and we basically eliminated all that text and just pointed back to uh, part two of the building code, chapter 11B. Next slide. Okay, a lot of what we did with uh, this code, we added the 1R at the beginning of the 2019 cycle, and we put a lot of it under uh, 309A, um, which is once a building is removed from acute care service, it's no longer uh, considered a hospital. So that would be under the non-A chapters. So we basically restructured a lot of uh, chapter three, uh, specifically section 309, to better align with that concept. So we moved a lot of language from 309A into, and 310A, actually 310A in its entirety into 309, because again, the A chapters are specific to hospitals. So, 309A has been retitled to Hospital SPC and Freestanding Buildings. You've seen that a lot in the, every application of each part. Uh, we wanted to clarify that it does uh, apply to an SPC building as well as a freestanding building removed from general acute care services and remaining under the jurisdiction of OSHPOD. And basically that's what all of this language says. Um, designation OSHPOD 1R shall be limited to provisions applicable to the overall hospital SPC and freestanding building. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the 1R is a building type and um, not applied to the occupancy. Uh, this also has been relocated from section 310A. Uh, moving it into the 309 section basically states that general acute care hospital um, shall conform with the requirements of um, 1.10.1, which is now a 1R building. It also states what qualifies as a freestanding building, as well as um, 309.1.3 is the, all the access points into a hospital uh, SPC buildings removed from the general acute care shall prominently display signage at each access stating that no general acute care services beyond this point. So they have to delineate when you're leaving the hospital and entering a non-hospital building. Uh, we actually already had confusion with pharmacies that are required to be in the hospital building being relocated in a non-hospital building. So um, this is to help clarify that point. And again, just to remind you that uh, Section 310A was rewritten and incorporated in 309 um, to just better align with a non hospital use. Um, we're, for definitions for freestanding and SBC building, we're pointing back to uh, part one and part two uh, for definitions. And um, buildings, 309.3 is buildings to remain under OSHPOD jurisdiction at identifying free, when freestanding buildings can qualify for non acute care services. And to qualify for non acute care services, uh, they must be considered outpatient clinical services. And uh, as listed here, these are some examples of what would be considered outpatient clinical service. You have administrative space, central sterile supply, storage, morgue, employee dressing room and locker rooms, janitorial and housekeeping and laundry. And next slide. And these are the qualifying services for what can go into a 1R building. Um, in addition to those outpatient portions of the following services that can see uh, no more than 25% inpatient are your surgical uh, departments, would be outpatient surgical in this case, chronic dialysis, psychiatry, rehab, 
uh, maternity, dentistry, and chemical dependency. All these things can go into a 1R building and see up to 25% inpatient use. Uh, services that duplicate basic services. Um, so if you have a pharmacy in the main hospital but want to expand it into the 1R building or have another addition or a, a separate lab, for example, uh, that can be done as long as it's above and beyond what's required for basic services that's already in the hospital building. Um, all hospital support services listed in section 309.3.1, item A, that are located in an SPC building at the time of general acute care services, um, that the time that general acute care services are removed may remain, okay, provided that CDPH certifies uh, to OSHPOD that it has received and approved a plan that demonstrates how the health facility will continue to provide all basic services in the event of the emergency when the SPC building may no longer remain functional. Next slide. Again, these are all requirements of a building that's removed from acute care service and what can go into them. Now we continue to explain that an SPC, as opposed to a freestanding building, um, an SPC non-general acute care hospital building containing non-acute care services under an existing license uh, may be permitted under the following conditions. Existing approved non-acute care services shall be permitted to remain. Uh, the enforcing agency may require evidence that the existing occupancies and services in, are in compliance at the time they were located in the SPC building. Kind of goes to the remodel uh, can that if they were built uh, in compliance with the code when they were built, they may be able to continue to be used. Okay, if an SPC building removed from general acute care ser services um, can be allowed to have other services in there, but they must be in excess, in excess of the minimum requirements for licensure and operation at the acute care hospital. So that's where I was going back to, like say uh, an example for storage. You have storage in the existing hospital and you must meet the requirements for storage in that hospital. You want to expand that storage for the hospital it can be in the SPC building or the 1R building okay new non-acute care services listed in 309.3.1 which we looked at earlier item a shall be permitted provided they are in excess of the minimum services required for licensure or operation again uh, you still need to meet all the requirements for basic services in the hospital building and the non-acute care hospital can of additional uses that are in excess of what was required. The items and item B that we discussed, uh, the morgue and all that, these services require compliance with the current functional requirements for that service as defined. Um, so what this says is the if you have um, same use and it's the same functional, we're looking at the functional requirements for that. So you just need to make sure that all the functional elements are there. So that allows these older facilities to, or older buildings to be used for, um, for these purposes without upgrading them all. Do non-acute care services in item C shall be permitted provided they are in excess of the minimum service required for licensure. Okay, if patients are served by this service, it must meet the current functional requirements for that service. Again, uh, we're looking, uh, if you're reusing a patient unit, an old med surge unit for outpatient observation, a lot of the requ functional requirements are already in place. They don't need to be meet current code. As long as they were uh, installed in compliance at the time they were built, they can continue to be reused. Next slide. Okay, sorry, this is a little bit long, but uh, some of these points are, they come up as questions all the time. If you have an SPC, non-acute care building, uh, containing a change of licensed nursing service under an existing license, 
um, the change of service for or function for all or a portion of that building removed from general acute care service requires compliance with the functional requirements for that service. Again, we're going to be looking at you have all the components, the soil utility, clean utility, anything that's required for that service. This is, uh, again, to give a lot of liberties to reusing these uh, older buildings without a complete remodel. Uh, if you're doing intermediate care or skilled nursing, which can go in a 1R building, uh, you must meet the separate, uh, must meet the requirements for that space. If it's intended to be used as a distinct part uh, facility, um, you must comply with the current functional requirements as defined in part two, uh, 122438, which is um, your intermediate care, or 122440, which is your skilled nursing facility in a hospital, and uh, 307A, and that's your utilities. Uh, you do still need to re meet the accessibility requirements for that space. So you, in this case, you would need 50% accessibility. Same with psychiatric services in that in the 1R. Um, you'd still need to you meet the functional requirements so that patient room sizes um, may not be an issue, but you do need to provide all the functional requirements, the consult rooms, uh, whatever would be required, um, isolation or uh, observation rooms uh, required in a psychiatric facility would still need to be provided. Next slide. And we're almost done with this. Um, for SBC non-acute buildings containing occupancies and their uses, basically it's the same that subject to the approval of the building official, in this case would be Ashbad, the use of, or occupancy of this existing buildings is allowed to be occupied for purposes in other groups or within the same group provided the new or proposed use is less hazardous based on life and fire risk than the existing use. So again, another way of allowing a lesser risk use be put into a um, hospital building that does not have acute care. And then the uh, vacant space is actually kind of cannibalized from another section um, from 309A, which requires, has the requirements listed for vacant spaces. And you must submit a project to the office to show that that remediation is being done. And this is basically capping off any exposed uh, plumbing systems and um, things that aren't being used in that space. Next slide. Okay, this one we're moving into the 309A. So this is specific to hospital buildings. So uh, this is the process of removing the hospital building from the hospital. Um, so that's why it's in the A chapter. It's still considered part of the hospital. Um, so the provisions of this section shall apply to a hospital SBC freestanding building that it is being intended to be removed from a general acute care service. Um, removal of these buildings shall satisfy the requirements of this section and the California Building Standards Code. Okay, OSHPOT approval is required and a building permit is required for this removal. And typically we see it come in as a series of projects to get to the final uh, conformance documents. Okay, if a building remaining under OSHPOD jurisdiction, the SPC and freestanding buildings removed from acute care service uh, actually have to remain under OSHPOD jurisdiction. And uh, vacated these, actually we already went over both 309A4 and A6 just in the slide before this. And this is just a pointer back to those sections uh, for vacated spaces and buildings remaining under Ashbon jurisdiction. Next slide. So now we're going to switch over to Roy to go over the site structural components of this. Okay. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, uh, I am Roy Lobo. I'm the principal structure engineer with Ashbon. Uh, right now, we're going to be talking about the code changes to chapter uh, to to part ten 
basically we made only one structural change and that's to chapter 3a and that is related to building separations uh, 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 these are basically uh, adjacent buildings which uh, we want to make sure that if you have a building that is spc1 or spc2 and you're trying to upgrade that building to an spc 4d performance ca performance category uh, then there is an adjacent building check that needs to be um, needs to be verified and uh, in order and and sometimes you know we find that we have all these buildings adjacent to each other and they may not meet the adjacent building criteria that is specified in the california administrative code and you said okay if you don't meet those criteria then what do you do and uh, uh, if you looked at the uh, provisions in asc 41 uh, for adjacent buildings uh, there's a building separation requirement and that requirement and the exceptions from doing a pounding analysis check was different from what is there in the California Administrative Code. So uh, we currently have buildings that are SPC4, SPC5 that would not meet the criteria given in uh, AAC 4113 uh, for building separation. So we are saying, okay, we're going to convert buildings that are SPC1 and SPC2 to SPC4D that do not meet the adjacent building criteria uh, but but i'm just saying is which, which will be different now between what ac 41 is saying and uh, the california administrative code is saying now for example you have buildings that um, uh, where the flows do not line up right as the, the figure on the right i don't know if my mouse works here but the figure on the right hand side will show you when your flows do not line up or you have uh, buildings that are of different heights, you could have pounding impacting the building and causing the upper, uh, upper building to collapse on the lower building. So when you have those conditions, you know, then you need to do a pounding evaluation or you need to increase your building separation. So those are, the, those are what you have to do. But a lot of times, you know, uh, the flows line up and it's also very difficult to make a change to add a building separation uh, uh, for an, uh, two existing buildings you know so both both buildings are existing to make that change is sometimes difficult so we said okay how are you going to do a pounding analysis what is the evaluation for that and uh, and uh, taking all those into consideration we said okay we are going to say we do not need to do a pounding evaluation when you do not meet the building deficiency as defined in the CAC, uh, but there are certain other criteria that you need to meet, okay? Now, just, as, I, as I just said earlier, I may not have said it very clearly, was that the requirements in AAC 41 are different from the requirements in the CAC for adjacent building. So we try to align it more to what the CAC said, but at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, those requirements would meet the performance objective for SPC 4D. Next slide. Okay, so what are the requirements for getting an SPC 4D building from an SPC 1 or SPC 2? So there are three criteria that need to be satisfied. First of all, it needs to meet the damage control uh, structural performance level at the BAC1E. What is the BAC1E? BAC1E is the 20% is the in 50-year uh, design earthquake. And uh, we are still sticking with the AAC4113, uh, which then references the AAC710. Uh, and then so, so, so the ground motions are locked to that period in time. So it's the it's the it's the 20% earthquake, 20% uh, uh, in 50-year earthquake that we are targeting for the BAC 1D level, as uh, defined in AAC 710, and then we are also uh, targeting the collapse prevention for a BAC 2E earthquake, which is the 5% in 50 years. Okay, so so we've locked the ground motion, so we're not going to change that. So if you meet these criteria then your building can be classified from SPC1 to SPC2. And then 
in addition to that, you need to meet the Article 10 deficiencies as uh, specified in the California Administrative Code at the BAC 1E level. So those are the criteria to be satisfied. And if you do that, then you will your building can be reclassified from SPC 1 or SPC 2 to SPC 4D. Uh, now, next slide. So, but in order to do that, uh, you know, one of the requirements to meeting those criteria for AAC 41 is building separations. So, and, uh, and if you do not have the necessary seismic separation for AAC 41, uh, then you have to do what is called a pounding analysis. Okay. So, if you do not meet these requirements, you need to do pounding analysis. Now, how do you evaluate a pounding analysis? How do you justify that your pounding analysis, after a pounding analysis, your building is still going to be okay? That's kind of difficult to do. So we said, is there a subset of buildings that we can say, you know, meets the California Administrative Code, does not uh, meet the uh, requirements in uh, AAC 41, 13, but we can say, you know, for those buildings, we do not need to do a pounding evaluation. So we said seismic separation is deemed to comply with SPC 4D requirements and a pounding analysis not required when either A or B apply. Next slide. So item A is if the building was constructed using the 1989 or later edition of the California code, Building Code. So these are basically buildings that are SPC 5 buildings. So if the building was, con it was an SPC-5 building, that means it's already assumed that the adjacent building deficiency in the CAC was already satisfied. Therefore, we said, you know what, if it was all, if the building, the adjacent building to the SPC-1 is an SPC-5, we're assuming that condition has already been satisfied. We're not going to check it for uh, to reclassify the SPC-1 or 2 buildings to SPC-4D. Okay. So, then the only only other criteria is that if it meets the uh, requirements of the CAC chapter 6 section 3.4 then we said is that good enough or are there other criteria we need to add next slide so is that if it meets these then what other additional criteria do we need to add to say that you do not need to do a pounding analysis per AAC 41. And uh, we came up with these criteria. So the first one was that the structural resisting system of the adjacent building is different. The masses uh, of the more flexible building is no greater than 50% of the mass of the stiffer building. So that's what we put in there. That's going to change. I'm going to be talking about that. Uh, and then the second criteria was that if you do not have what's called a fatal flaw in a building, such as load path, weak story, soft story, vertical dis discontinuity, or torsion, that means these are basically, if you have your building has any of these vulnerabilities, then it is susceptible to collapse in an earthquake. So that means you said your adjacent building uh, to the one that you're going to retrofit to SPC 40 does not have any of these, and it satisfies the requirement in the CAC, then you do not need to do a pounding evaluation, okay? So, so that was the, the criteria that was decided to say that, okay, these are the additional requirements uh, for by which you can avoid doing a pounding evaluation. Next slide. So what are the new updates coming? Okay, so the new updates are coming. Again, these are for the buildings being classified to SPC 4D using AAC 41. And the same three criteria apply. Next slide. So the exemptions in AAC 41, you know, were different from the ones that we just introduced into the 2019 mid-cycle. But what I just showed you, if people were having difficulty in understanding or the location we put those changes, did not really capture the intent of what we were trying to do. So we said um, the exemptions in AAC 41, we're going to say, we're going to replace that whole section. We just added on uh, to, to that. In addition to the exemptions you have here, you will put this third exemption. We said, we're going to delete all of that. We're going to replace that whole section with this new section. Okay, so 
the new exemptions are now given here. We said, first of all, the building was constructed in 1989 or later, so that means an SPC 5 building. But then we didn't clarify that it has to be under Oshpot jurisdiction and the minimal. And so if it is an Oshpot building, then you do not need to meet the minimum separation requirements. And we said, we want to make sure that this only applies to uh, this only applies to uh, buildings reclassified to SPC 4D. And SPC 4D has a performance uh, objective of uh, damage control at the BAC 1E. So we said it need not be evaluated for structural performance levels for damage control or lower, that means damage control, life safety, or collapse, right? So then you don't need to do that if it's an SPC 5 building. Next slide. And the other requirement was that uh, we removed the requirement, you know, where the masses are different, uh, and there's a, you know, and and that they are different lateral force resisting system because people were having difficulty in trying to identify and doing that evaluation between the two buildings. So it was becoming a, a little bit of a challenge uh, to do that. So we said we're just going to delete that additional requirement it has to meet the requirements in the cac and then it also has to meet additional requirements that i showed uh, earlier at the same time we said okay if we don't meet those requirements then what is the building separation are we just going to go with that means in order to do meet the requirements in az 41 you need to calculate what that separation was so we said, okay, we will clarify that. And we said, if you meet the building separation of two inches per floor for the CAC, then that will be good enough. So if your adjacent building met that separation and it also was not considered immediately adjacent, then you did not do a pounding analysis. And then all the other requirements that we specified in the 2019 building uh, in, in the mid-cycle code will remain. So that is, if your building should also not have these fatal flaws like load part, weak story, soft story, et cetera. Next slide. So we said that if you cannot meet your separation distance, right, then you can, there's a third path, right? Then you will do a pounding analysis. So we started with when is your pounding analysis not required? And then I said, these are the exceptions from that. And then if you do not meet those criteria, you know, you, you fall into the criteria that your building is less than half as tall, uh, or your flows do not line up, then you have to do a pounding analysis. But now for those conditions, I would recommend that you actually do a building separation if it's possible, otherwise the pounding analysis. And if you do a pounding analysis, then you will have to show that the buildings are capable of transferring those forces without collapse or you don't you know for for each of these criteria so uh with that uh next slide i'm done all right thank you roy for for that uh and everybody who presented up good information we're hoping that Everyone is uh, gaining some some insight as to what's going on within Oshpod, and we're able to clarify some issues. If you still have questions about what we presented, or if you have a question about a specific project that you're looking to get clarification on, please email us at that email address that you see on your screen, regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. Again, that's R-E-G-S, unit at O-S-H-P-D. And we want to thank everyone who has taken the time to submit questions within the GoTo panel question box. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and answer those questions uh, in the order that we receive them. So first question that we have, going back to mechanical code, Dave, if you're still there, reads, uh, in reference to section 306.2 of the CMC, how would you expect engineers to, to prove this? if okay, just mentioned in the uh, spec or want it on the control diagram or SOO spelled out on the plans. Dave might have got cut off. He's trying to re-log in. Okay, well, we can come back to that question. We can go ahead and, and uh, moving on to from his. the next set of questions. 
going back to the, I believe Richard, this may be yours. Um, I'll make up stuff for Dave. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, so we'll go, uh, how about a hospital with inpatient pharmacy and Oshpod one building? Can compounding services be provided in the racks building? No, uh, what it is that the, if the, the pharmacy is serving the patients in the hospital, the pharmacy and the compounding has to be located in the hospital it's serving. Because if something happens in an event and that building goes down for some reason, or is unable to get access to the hospital, they still need to be able to treat the patients. So the for a pharmacy, we're seeing a lot of retail pharmacies put in racks, um, as well as just a redundant or satellite pharmacy. But if it, they have to meet the minimum requirements for the compounding for their patients in the hospital building. Great, thank you, Richard. We have another question for you, Richard. Uh, this this is dealing with part 10 section uh, in reference 309.3.5. What's the deadline for submitting a project? In general, humidity control has been applied for a sensitive area. And I'll stop there because it looks like that's a Dave question. But um, going back to part 10, what's the, t what's the time deadline for submitting uh, a project? For a vacant space? The question is, does not clarify. Uh, actually, it does. It says to a to mitigate a vacant space hazard. Yeah, when a vacant space project, there's no uh, defined time limit. But basically, if you're doing a project, you have a vacated space in there. Either want to include um, the protections in that space as part of the original project or do a separate project. Um, if there's something going back in there it, uh, immediately following, you don't need to worry about it. But if it's going to remain vacant, a lot of times we'd like to see, uh, we do require that you do submit something to close that space up to make it uh, safe to be unoccupied. That kind of sound, that sounds kind of uh, redundant or weird to say that safe when unoccupied, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, sewer gases, other things that could come up, as well as dead legs to some of the facilities that they're not being used need to be uh, cleared. Perfect. Um, and I'm looking through the rest of the questions here, Richard, and you can help me out if you uh, can. Most of these questions relate to mechanical code and plumbing code. Um, I'm wondering if we have Dave back on the call and i don't see his name in the list of attendees yeah. yeah he said he's trying to get back on he got kicked off by our uh internet security timed out on him so he's trying to get back in um there's one here oh. about accessibility for the uh, foot operated hand washing facilities that is the answer is basically no you can't uh, use the foot controls anymore Perfect. Um, and we have another ba uh, another good question. It's in, and it goes back to uh, a it's a basic question. Wanting to know what is the Oshpod one designation? Good question. We actually have seminars just on that. Um, basically, Oshpod one R is a designation we've given to buildings that are removed removed from acute care service. Uh, you might commonly hear them referred to as RACS project remove RACS, remove from acute care service. Um, that is a way that we're tracking these buildings because they remain under OSHPOD jurisdiction if it's a 1R. So we track the building in our system by identifying them as 1R. What's important to remember is that any of the utilities that are serving that building, if it's coming from a hospital or um, is part of the hospital, um, do re do re require the same requirements of a hospital uh, for that. But if the occupants going in, depending on the occupancy going in, that's going to be based on the type of occupancy uh, going in. So there is a question about like equipment anchorage. Um, you know, it should a, should a 1R apply to all equipment anchorage in a hospital building? And the answer is no. If you have administrative building 
or uses within that space, you do not have the same equipment anchorage requirements. That's going to be for a B occupancy. So you use the equipment anchorage requirements for model code. Um, if you have a skilled nursing facility going in, you use the uh, occupancy requirements for uh, OSHPOD 2 uh, would be applied to that. And again, the services coming in would be part of the OSHPOD 1R building, um, but the actual uses in the space uh, would remain per the groups. A uh, good example, this is OSHPOD 3. Putting a clinic space in is going to be OSHPOD 3. Um, you want the same requirements you know, for the, the HVAC, the electrical, and all the planning for an OSHPOD 3. If it's an unlicensed clinic space, you're going to have different requirements for that space. But you do have to be aware that if you want to switch over at another time, that you may have to bring them up to uh, OSHPOD 3 requirements. So it's something to keep in mind for future planning. But, um, there's uh, going to be a lot of different uses in the OSHPOD 1R buildings, and so the requirements for the spaces are by the occupancy. Good. Uh, great, Richard. got another question for you. Um, do we anticipate changes to fuel requirements and SNFs in California, or will we re uh, continue to follow model code? For SNFs? you're still gonna use OSHPOD 2 for skilled nursing facilities. I'm not seeing that question on here. Um, can it's, you repeat uh, the question? The bottom. Yeah, it's towards the bottom and it's from Jonathan. And the question reads, do we anticipate changes to fuel requirements for SNFs oh, fuel in California? Requirements. Sorry, I didn't read, yes. I didn't read the whole thing. Um, do we anticipate changes? I anticipate them, yes. Are they happening? No. Um, right now, there is a an allowance in the um, CMS that provides for the fuel requirements to be 96 hours, um, but there is an a option to be able to provide refueling in an emergency. So you have to have an emergency plan in place to uh, provide the refueling and you can go to a lesser amount of fuel, I believe it's six hours on that. Um, are they, the legislature is still looking at that. Uh, there was a bill last year that did not make it through. And um, so I do think this will continue to be addressed um, at various levels. So you just have, as of right now, we're still, we're going uh, as we are, have been. Okay, and I'm looking again. We want to take this opportunity to to thank you for submitting questions. Uh, we're it seems like we're having uh, a bit of an issue having Dave uh, log back in. So for those questions that are specific to uh, mechanical and plumbing, what we will do is we will go ahead and answer those questions uh, specifically in an email to you, as we have your email address. Uh, we we got that once you logged in and registered for the event. So. If Dave is not able to come back on, we'll go ahead and uh, send those out to you individually for those questions that were asked. And want to encourage you, if you're still there, to go ahead and submit more questions that may be related to structural existing building code, maybe 1R, uh, so we, we can go ahead and take advantage of this opportunity to provide those answers for you. Um, yeah. Dave is, uh, says he's on, but he doesn't have audio yet, so he may hopefully be joining you, us here again. There, there are a couple other questions. This, I this can is Dave. Answer. Can you guys hear me? We hey, can, Dave, yeah. can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, Welcome thanks. The back. system is really going sideways on me there. You got to love technology, oh. Dave. <laughs> so yeah, I, got I, I do see there's a lot of, there are a lot of questions, and I'm, uh, I'm eager to help answer them. I've got about 10 minutes left, and... Uh, so however we're going to answer those long term but for everybody, uh, I'm all in on that. That's great, Dave. Uh, first question for you we have is uh, related to the mechanical code, uh, section 306.2. How would you expect engineers to prove this? Okay, if just mentioned in the, sp in the spec or want it on the control diagrams or SO spelled out on the plans? Uh, yes, you know, this is uh, in reality, this is a capability that's already in this equipment that we deal with, 
right? Especially these large boilers and chillers, they, they all have hand controls, at least they from every, everyone that I've seen. My recommendation would be um, stated specifically on the design documents that this capability has to be there. That's it. I mean, that that's the end of the argument for us. Uh, we just want to see that it's there, and hopefully that answers the question. And um, you know, it's not it's not the best code uh, the way this is written, but um, it's a capability that Oshpod wanted, so we have it in there. So great. We got another okay, question. I got a, I got a list that. of questions for you, Dave. So we'll go to we'll go ahead yeah, and try to get these as fast as possible. So in section three, I won't, two, answer. Zero. I won't answer any of Glenn's questions. I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, again, I, I believe right. Glenn has left, but uh, but he did ask some great questions. Uh, next question reads: yeah, he did. Yeah. Three twenty point four. Does this apply to both intermediate distribution facilities (IDF) and main distribution facilities (MDF)? Yeah, you know, um, the intent of that language, from what I remember in our early discussions, it was MDF mainly. It was the main uh, IT rooms. Uh, you know, that said. Um, We'll probably have a little more discussion on that. It's a great question. Uh, I'm going to verify Dave, what I just said a little later. Yeah. Dave, this is Bill Gow. Yeah, it's it's for the um, main distribution frame. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that was the that was the intent of it. That that is why we changed the name for that room. That room is defined in the building code mm -hmm. in 1224.5. Yeah. And it is the one your one yeah. main distribution frame. Great. Yes. Um, Thank you. Question. Yes, sir. Got another question for the team. Uh, when you have an Oshpod 3 building, do we need to comply with the Title 24, uh, Chapter 6 energy, which says 15 CSM, CFM per person, and then a CFM per square foot, whichever is greater? Um, going to try to answer that one, you guys? Yeah, the energy code yeah, does, uh, for energy what, does apply. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, um, for your standard Oshpot facilities, there's an exemption for ventilation requirements as they're listed in part six, okay? As a default, we avoid that and go to our requirements specifically for um, medical facilities. Now, Oshpot three facilities historically have been held to part six um, requirements as reviewed by the locals. Now, there's a there's a little hiccup in that in that coverage, right? Um, Richard, maybe you want to chime in on that, but um, they are under the blanket right now. The exemptions offered to all the other Oshpot facilities, and there, there are multiple exemptions for that. Yeah, alterations so. to healthcare facilities are currently exempt under Section 141, uh, Part Six. Yes. Green and Part Eleven still applies. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay. Great. Thank, thank you both. I got a, a question related to ventilation air. The question reads: Does ventilation air uh, require or prohibit operable windows in a hospital occupancy, or neither? Oh yeah. You know, I love that question. I love that question because I, I actually am. In, I'm really in favor of operable windows in a hospital. Uh, but you're going to have to argue that with our uh, with our architects a little bit, like I do, and. Uh, um, Natural ventilation right now does not apply uh, for these facilities, okay? Um, that said, I don't think it means that we cannot have operable windows. It just does not count as ventilation. Correct. Um, anybody else can chime in on that? Okay. I agree with you, Dave. Okay. That's a great question. Great. We got another ventilation question. This, uh, this question reads, uh, in section 402.1.3, ventilation in, in healthcare facilities, which additions and associated agenda of ASHRAE 170 and 62.1 are adopted and applicable? Okay, another great question. Now, in order to meet uh, CMS requirements, it's ASHRAE 170 2008. It's the very first version of ASHRAE 170, which uh, none of us really like because there's all kinds of nice advancements beyond that. OSHPOD has specifically adopted uh, ASHRAE 170 2013 through addendum AE. We have that specifically in the code right there in that section of the mechanical code. For all intents and purposes, there really are no conflicts for ventilation requirements between that version and the official uh, 2008 version. So uh, to answer that quickly, it's a very early version of, of ASHRAE 170. Um, so hopefully that answers that. 
Great. Uh, this is a, this is a kind of an involved question for you, uh, Dave. So no 100% zero A. So how does one remodel a legacy 100% zero A system when required to rebalance per CAN 2-102.6 if its ACH mm -hmm. is not on the list? Okay, that's a great question. You know, the, the extent to which you have to comply with new current codes or the code that the facility was designed under depends on the extent of the scope of the project in, this, in the remodel work for the remodel can. That's clear as mud, I know. And, um, but we always work with, uh, read the text of remodel can carefully for that. And we'll always work with designers and healthcare providers to, to come up with the best commonsensical approach on a remodel. Now, uh, the opening statement there, that there's no 100% outdoor air systems. Please understand that's actually not true. We do not prohibit 100% outdoor air systems. We uh, encourage them, we like them. If I were designing a hospital, that's what I would design to. So code does not prohibit those. What was prohibited was uh, air change rates that are below the ASHRAE 170 requirements. So it's a great question and it, it, it came up a lot when we were drafting that, that change. Thanks for that. Yeah. And I'd like to add on to that is kind of, yeah, when he's referring to the remodel can, um, if it was designed per that, uh, Dave's correct, it's gonna depend on the extent of the remodel. Otherwise it remains as is you can continue to use the the original design requirements from when it was originally permitted if it was permitted in compliance that was that was a great question and, and great clarification from you both so thank you uh, we have another mechanical question uh, related to a boiler that is not listed for alcove installation does it still require to comply with the cmc chapter three specifically CMC 303.0? The 303.0 I'd have to look at. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, I don't know if, any, if the commenter can, can add to that. Um, Great. It, it uh, obviously would not apply to anything we've lined out. Any chance I can answer that one later? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Or so, can, uh, Warren, if you're there, uh, please yeah. please clarify that question, and we'll move on to the next. Uh, so, yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Thanks, Dave. Uh, laboratory non-porous materials. Does this mean that laboratory fixtures set in countertops cannot have any porous material in the countertop, such as a practical board under the plastic laminate? Particle board. Oh yeah. Yep. I'm sorry. Particle. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Um, I, I welcome uh, Richard's input on this. Uh, the surface is what we're worried about there in terms of non-porous. You know, as a mechanical, I love flowing clean water and porcelain. But as far as the countertops, uh, Richard, I think a non, I think a laminated that's non-porous would be the requirement here. Lamination. Yeah, it almost reads like it's the lab itself. But, um, mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. looking that one up. Yeah. My, I lost my question box. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Never found it. It closed up on me. Yeah. To, to have you know, to have something around a handler fixture that's, that's porous would be uh, um, sounds like it would be not good design. But uh, yeah, I, hopefully we've answered that. As it relates to the uh, auto uh, auto shutoff, um, does thirteen oh four point one point three mean auto shutoff or seismic? Oh yeah, yeah. That was in terms of the uh, the med gas system uh, notes that we were talking about. Now, if you look at it, if you look at for, if you look at a PA ninety nine for class one um, medical gas systems, there is zero mention of automatic shutoffs. They don't even address it, and there's a reason for that, I believe. Even though I didn't, I'm not on the committee for that. Um, they, uh, you're not going to have automatic shutoffs on 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 med gas systems that uh, keep people alive. In, in surgeries and otherwise, because I think there's the concern that with NAPA 9, NAPA 99 was um, malfunctions or shutting things off and, and killing people. So um, no auto shutoffs that I know of at all. Right, and sticking with MedGas, why can't Oshpot 3 building have MedGas located in an Oshpot 3 building? Yeah, and that's a great question. If you read the language of that code change carefully, I believe, You'll note that you can provide gas to an Oshpod 3 from an Oshpod 3. One of the big issues there is we don't share Oshpod 3 versus Oshpod 1. 
mainly due to jurisdiction issues. We've always had concerns that an Oshpod clinic would go in uh, with a hyperbaric service center, for example. And uh, you ever seen one of those? They're fascinating. I've been involved in them. But they can have, if it's an Oshpod 3, the jurisdiction is such that the load can vary wildly. And we'd never know about it at Oshpod. And you'd be serving both Oshpod 1 and 3 and would impact the system. So, but you can't have source uh, Oshpod uh, or, or MedGas sources within the Oshpod 3 serving the Oshpod 3. Same thing with a 1R. Okay, so hopefully I've answered that. Great, and we have a lot of great questions, Dave. Thank you for, for uh, your input and Richard as well. Um, sticking with the MedGas topic, if MedGas systems is served only, uh, is serving only OshPod 3 building and the facility has no OshPod 1 or 2, can the MedGas system still remain in an OshPod 3 building? Yeah, I think I just answered that, yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, now, moving on to humidity control. In general, humidity control has been applied for sensitive area. CMC mm -hmm. 2019 Table 4A has indicated relative humidity range for a lot of rooms that are not listed as the sensitive area. Mm -hmm. Please clarify if the humidity control is required for non-sensitive area or room that is not listed on Section 32, 322.0. Yeah, a great question. Just so you know, if you look at the text uh, showing um, relative humidity requirements in Table 4A, you'll notice that the text on those is almost entirely all of those are straight text, okay? That means they're model code. They're right out of ASHRAE 170. So they're in there so that the facility and the designer of the facility will comply with ASHRAE 170. That's why those are in there. Those are taken right out of the, the national standard. Um, we specifically are not necessarily requiring controls in those spaces that are non-sensitive that have those, those listings. But understand that uh, numbers on, on table 4A indicate that we need the facility to be able to provide those conditions. It doesn't mean that it has to be run all the time within those conditions, okay? That's a great question it's, and it gets pretty involved. Um, so um, feel free to follow up with me later via email if you want more clarification on that. I appreciate that one. Great. Yeah, thanks for the question. And I'll go ahead and, and plug that email address one more time, uh, regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. Um, now, dealing with undercounter lavatories, uh, Dave, does an undercounter mm -hmm. mounted lavatory comply with the requirements of CPC section 210.02B? Uh, I believe I believe that it does. I believe that it does, and that's a, uh, once again, I can follow up more on that. I've never ha heard that question um, before, um, and it's a great question. I don't remember ever seeing one that was uh, under counter mounted, um, but I'd like to learn more about it by answering this question later if I can. Great. Um, next question deals with uh, more, of a, more of a clarification, if you will. For OshPod 5 applications, a solid surface anti-ligature lavatory fixture is a typical specification in lieu of stainless steel fixtures. It appears that the solid surface fixtures no longer conform, confirm, or conform based on the requirements of CPC section 210.02 D as in door. Please confirm. Um, I don't have that in front of me. D, can somebody bring that up or? Yeah, it's a basic year exam and it's a psych facility yeah. from mm -hmm. the gooseneck requirement yeah yeah and there is model code language in the plumbing code uh, specifically calling out for site facilities you have non-ligature so hopefully that answers that it is, it is exempt from that great and this uh and this question is from one of our own uh gene uh, the question the question reads for redundancy of water heaters if a facility has boilers and multiple storage tanks do the tanks have to reflect the same redundancy requirements? For example, three water storage tanks and one tank develops a leak and needs to be replaced. Should it be able to be removed without having to cut into the interfering water lines? Also, would this apply equally to SNFs as to GAC hospitals? Okay, whether or not it can be designed or replace a tank without adversely affecting the, the associated piping really is a design issue. Um, you'd want to have valves in there such that you could service and or remove a tank without affecting um, the system for very long. You know, you'd have temporary dead ends that, were, that are not allowed right now in, in hot water systems. Um, there is language in ASHRAE 170 about redundancy of, of boilers uh, providing hot water 
and I'm sorry, I don't have that verbiage off the top of my head right now specifically, um, but uh, hopefully I'm answering that question. You know, they're, they're, redundancy is very, very simple. If you take one thing out, you know, the rest of the remaining stuff has to be able to carry the load. Now, in terms of, there are some standalone like instantaneous water heaters where we have storage tanks associated with those water heaters. The, the redundancy in that case does apply to the tanks. Like if you have three uh, instantaneous water heaters all filling one tank, well, if that tank goes down, now you don't have, you're not serving the, the facility correctly. And I hope that makes sense. Very good question. It does come up once in a while. Yeah, so that, that brings up uh, something that I wanted to mention. If if we provide, if we read the answer and we provide the question, uh, the answer to the question, and it still doesn't make sense or you still want to have a further discussion, please, please, please email us at regsunit at oshpa.ca.gov. Next question reads, so all lavatories are to be provided with gooseneck faucets and regardless of application? No, no, lavatories, no. Uh, go ahead, Richard, you're going to say something? No, I was, you, I was probably going to say the same thing. Is you no, know, there's there's a, there's exceptions, and they're they're clearly identified. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. The the requirement mm -hmm. of the gooseneck yeah. fountain hasn't changed. It's just the design of the gooseneck has been clarified. Correct. That that's correct. Yeah. Now, in terms of how, the the configuration of the handwash fixture itself, that's controlled by the, by the footnotes in Table Four Two of the Plumbing Code, and that hasn't changed. So you have three different levels. You have a non-touch which is for surgery center scrub sinks, for example. Uh, you have a standard hand wash fixture, which you'd find often in, a, let's say, an ante room or a nurse station. Then you have the, the, the low grade, I would call it, which is standard control, which you'd find in like a public laboratory uh, type of installation. So check that out. Check out the footnotes in table 4.2 of the plumbing code. Great, thank it's not you. Easy, it's not an easy read, so <laughs> go ahead with that. <laughs> Again, these some of these questions are pretty involved, and, and you're referencing specific uh, yeah. code sections. So if we provide a uh, an answer and you still need clarification, please contact us, and we'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, mm -hmm. Next, Richard, I believe this question is for you, uh, dealing with um, cost systems. For cost systems, what is the definition of non-attached? And that is where. <laughs> Richard, this is Bill. I think they're referring to the nurse call system. That's and, what I'm thinking uh, too. And and I I don't understand non-attached, so I I need more help to be able to answer that question. So. Right. So so that's that's a good opportunity, Charles. If you're there, um, please email us at that that uh, okay. email address that we've shared for further clarification and and have that discussion. So coming back to the plumbing code, would CPC section 323.0 also apply to plumbing fixtures with respect to having their uh, have their noted in the plumbing fixture schedule, or is it exclusive to equipment only? I'm drawing a blank on uh, what's being asked there. I'd have to. Um, three, three. Let me see here. Uh, I'm sorry, can we go on to the next one? I'm gonna try to bring this up as we continue on, okay? Yeah, the, I, I'm looking at this. The only reference we have to any something not attached in here is regarding refrigeration for technology equipment centers not attached to a patient care area. <coughs> when it says not right. attached, it means not serving, correct? So not serving a patient care area. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe so. Well, let's say not attached for the refrigeration. It says for yes. technology equipment centers not attached to a patient care area. Yeah. 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 What, what what we were trying to address there is um, sometimes you can have imaging rooms that have a computer support room next to them, and those are starting to go away. But we didn't want to have a room where you have a patient. In, in managing uh, in, in imaging equipment and have a room right next to it with uh, a lot of refrigeration serving the room. Perfect. Hopefully that question. Okay. Yeah, hopefully, we, we, hopefully we've answered all of the questions um, that uh, were typed into the GoTo panel question box. 
Uh, we have one last question that we're going to go over, Dave, and I believe what the what the individual is asking for is uh, boiler room size. Is there a definition or a minimum requirement for that? Uh, no, from what I remember, what we've done with the the, uh, the code language, we really uh, avoided that. We're looking for clearances as required for fire safety, and we're looking for the inst the installation of the boilers to be per the listing. Okay, and that's that kind of mimics what was done in the newer NFPA guidance. So great, thank you. It's a good question. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Richard. I was say there's another question about section 321 uh, referencing OSHPOD uh, 3 and then it's uh, surgical clinics. Um, basically, yeah. 321 does include OSHPOD 3 surgical clinics. 321.1 does not, but the remainder of 321 does mm -hmm. apply. To, only 321.1 is exempt from the surgical clinic requirement. Yeah. Yeah, and the question read, uh, 321.0 has OSHPAR 3 surgical clinics only, when then 321.1 states does not apply, which is it? And right, Richard, and 321.2, et cetera, does apply. Yeah. Yeah, welcome to learning uh, code language. It's, it's, it's not an easy read at times. That's an example. Yeah, it's not an easy read, and and that's why we we like to we here as at Oshpod like to offer um, our, our contact information. If you have if you read the code and it's still not clear, or just have, want to have a, a, a conversation about a specific project that you're that you're looking for help on, uh, send us an email, and we we'd be happy to reach out to you and have that conversation as we move along. So Richard, um, if I captured all the questions. Um, I'd like to go ahead and close out this this presentation. Uh, yep. I want to go ahead and thank everyone for, for joining us here uh, at the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. Please log on to our website and look for upcoming webinars uh, and training sessions that we have on our website under the uh, webinar section, uh, presentation materials section as well. So with that being said, we want to thank you for taking the time today for joining us on this uh, this presentation we did we did handle some some technology issues and thank you for hanging on and uh and uh being here with us so until next time thank you for joining us and thank you for doing your part in providing access to safe quality healthcare environments within california